Okay, I'm John Holdren. I have been pressed into service uh, as the moderator of this panel. Uh, we will be hearing first uh, from Amory Lovins for 30 minutes, then from Peter Schwartz for 15 minutes, and then we will have the usual uh, panel discussion with the addition of Professor Wong to the group. Uh, I will introduce uh, each speaker uh, prior to their presentation. Therefore, I'll start with Amory Lovins. Uh, Amory, as uh, surely everyone in this room knows, otherwise you're in the wrong room, is co-founder and CEO of the Rocky Mountain Institute, a MacArthur Prize fellow, the winner of a gazillion other uh, national and international awards, uh, holder of a large number of honorary doctorates, advisor to an even larger number of heads of state, uh, and certainly one of the most interesting uh, energy analysts of the 20th century and now the 21st, Amory Levins. Well, thank you, John. After that over-generous introduction, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. Uh, <coughs> but I appreciate the honor of introducing some uh, new and old technologies uh, that can profitably protect the climate. Uh, <coughs> you might ask, uh, how is climate protection like the Hubble Space Telescope? And the answer is, of course, that they were both spoiled by a sign error. You may recall the mirror was ground to the wrong curve because someone got a plus sign and a minus sign mixed up. The same is true with climate protection. Approximately 100% of the empirical evidence says that protecting the climate is not costly but profitable because efficiency costs less than the energy it saves. And yet the political debate is all about cost, burden, and sacrifice. If instead it were about profit, jobs, and competitive advantage, the politics would be much easier. It's very puzzling that this shift has not happened yet. Uh, <clears throat> I think it comes perhaps from a dominance of economic theory over engineering practice in the foundations of the discussion. But many companies understand the profits and are pursuing them. For example, one of the world's biggest chip makers set a goal of zero net carbon emissions by 2010 when they expect to make 40 times the chips they made in 1990. They figured out how to cut their carbon intensity 90 odd percent profitably and they have in fact reduced their electricity per standard wafer 6 percent a year with an average payback of two and a half years retrofitting their plants. A very good return. IBM similarly has made a lot of money cutting carbon emissions in absolute terms nearly 6% per year. DuPont set an ambitious goal of 6% a year gain in energy efficiency in this decade while making a major shift to renewables and cutting the greenhouse gas emissions to 65% below the 1990 level. How are they doing? Well, so far they're 72% down. They're producing 30% more output with 7% less energy, and so far they've made $2 billion profit by substituting efficiency for energy. BP similarly said that it had met, like Shell, uh, its uh, carbon reduction goal eight years early. Uh, at they bashfully said zero net cost. When pressed, they admitted they'd made $650 million profit. Uh, Everyone that does this sort of thing makes money on it. So I don't know why we shouldn't admit profits and seek them rather than lamenting alleged costs. You could also say that the climate problem is caused by one percentage point. And John Holdren uh, started to get into this yesterday, uh, decomposing the rate of emitting carbon into the growth rates of population, GDP per capita, energy intensity, and carbon intensity. The normally assumed growth rates net out to 1% annual growth in carbon emissions, which is why they're normally projected to triple by 2100. And <clears throat> supply-siders endlessly debate whether the carbon-free energy term should be nuclear, renewables, or whatever. I'll talk about that a little, but I want to focus mainly on the four times bigger energy intensity term, because if we could drop energy intensity not by the assumed 1%, but by 2% per year. That would stabilize the rate of carbon emissions. 
Uh, and if we could drop energy intensity by a little more than 2% a year, it would stabilize climate. So could we actually do that? Well, if we look at the actual rates of decrease in energy intensity in different economies over different periods with different price behaviors, we see that with the numbers shown in italics, including stellar performance in reducing Chinese energy intensity using the LBL data, uh, are well over 2% a year, uh, even in periods when world prices were low and declining. And in fact, in the United States last year, we did 3.2% a year decrease in energy intensity. Uh, that was slightly greater than GDP growth, so energy use in the U.S. went down slightly last year. Uh, <clears throat> and California, as you see, does in general even better than the United States because it has better policies. Now, there are many ways to sustain these several percent per year reductions in energy intensity or the even greater reductions that major firms do when they pay attention. You can change the composition of output. Uh, we see some of the reverse shift in China in the last few years, but I think that's temporary. We can use land more sensibly so we don't need to travel so much to be where we want to be. We can be more mindful in individual choices. We can convert and distribute energy and, of course, use it much more efficiently. And we can use any mixture of these. So getting well over 2% a year decrease in energy intensity does not sound difficult, let alone costly. Uh, and I want to focus <clears throat> on a total of 83% of world CO2 production, namely uses of oil and uses of electricity. First on oil, a year and a half ago, my team published an independent peer-reviewed study that's completely presented transparently. No one's arguing with it. It's co-sponsored by the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, and it's written for business and military leaders, built around competitive strategy for cars, trucks, planes, oil, and military. They all seem to like it. <clears throat> you can download it free from oilendgame.com, and within about a year, I hope it will be published in Chinese through the courtesy of Professor Li at Tsinghua. Uh, and it presents a way over the next few decades to get the United States completely off oil, not just reduce imports, but eliminate oil use completely, led by business for profit while strengthening the economy. Uh, probably China can do the same thing by using similar techniques, although we didn't analyze that. And the U.S. transition looks like this. Oil use and oil imports, instead of climbing as officially forecast, would turn downward by redoubling the efficiency of using oil. This turns out to have an average cost of $12 a barrel in year 2000 dollars at a 5% real discount rate. We could then turn oil use and imports down steeply by replacing the other half of the oil with a combination of saved natural gas and advanced biofuels, mainly cellulosic ethanol. These have an average cost of $18 a barrel. So the average cost of not using oil and doing the same jobs in other ways is $15 a barrel, or about one-fifth today's oil price, assuming that uh, all externalities are worth zero, a conservatively low number. We've done this sort of thing before. The last time the United States paid attention to oil 1977 through 85, GDP rose 27 percent, oil use fell 17 percent, oil imports fell 50 percent, imports from the Persian Gulf fell 87 percent, and they would have been gone in one more year if we'd continued that. The result was that OPEC's exports fell by half. It broke their pricing power for a decade because the customers had more market power than the exporters, uh, especially in this country, the Saudi Arabia of mega barrels, we could save oil faster than OPEC could conveniently sell less oil. Well, we could do that again. Uh, <clears throat> and indeed, if we invest $180 billion, have to retool the car, truck, and plane industries, have to build a modern biofuels industry, then compared with buying $26 oil, the official forecast of two years ago for 2025, we would save $70 billion a year net, 150-odd billion dollars a year gross, 
we would incidentally cut CO2 emissions from the United States by 26 percent as a free byproduct of the profitable oil savings. We would get a million new jobs, three quarters of them rural, and we would get to save a million jobs now at risk, mainly in automaking. So it's an interesting deal. And all this can be done in a U.S. context without fuel taxes, mandates, subsidies, standards, or national laws, but all administratively or at a state level. In fact, the policy instruments we suggest, which are also as innovative as the technologies, uh, should generally be piloted at a state or local level, and they have very wide application. They're much more effective than the uh, taxes, trading, uh, or standards usually proposed. The key is, of course, transportation, which uses 70 percent of U.S. oil. We found that making vehicles much lighter and with better aerodynamics and tires and advanced propulsion would triple their efficiency very cheaply. For example, in the case of cars, it's like buying uh, gasoline at 15 U.S. cents per liter. Uh, for heavy trucks and planes, the savings are even cheaper. Uh, and <clears throat> in industry and buildings, those uses of oil often have reduced capital cost for dramatic efficiency gains. More about that later. You can also get interesting gains in performance. So, for example, this uh, carbon fiber diesel hybrid concept car can do 250 kilometers an hour, but also two and a half liters per hundred kilometers, 94 miles a gallon, although not at the same moment. Uh, <coughs> and the surprise is that the ultralighting, the carbon fiber construction shown in these four concept cars, is actually free because it's, the, the costlier materials are paid for by simpler automaking and a smaller propulsion system. Uh, the technology for efficient use of oil and indeed electricity is improving much faster than even the stunning advances in finding and lifting oil. That's why the efficiency resource is getting bigger and cheaper all the time. Now, we saw in <coughs> Vice President Gore's speech uh, the uh, standards expressed here in carbon terms uh, of various countries for car, new car efficiency. And you see China's doing much better than the U.S. down in the middle here. Just for comparison, the Prius of 2004 is down here, and the car I'll show you in a moment would be at 87 uh, of these units off the bottom of the scale running on gasoline. Uh, <clears throat> but to see how we can do dramatically better than those standards suggest, let's just think about the physics of a car. Seven-eighths of the fuel energy in a typical car today in the U.S does not reach the wheels. It is lost in the engine, idling, driveline, and accessories. Of the one-eighth that does reach the wheels, half of it heats the tires and road or heats the air that the car pushes aside, and only the last six percent actually accelerates the car and then heats the brakes when you stop. But since 95 percent of the mass you are accelerating is the car, not the driver, less than one percent of the fuel energy moves the driver. Not very good after 120 years of engineering effort. Fortunately, though, three quarters of the fuel use is caused by the car's weight, and every unit of energy you save at the wheels saves another seven units of energy that you need not waste getting it to the wheels. So there is huge leverage in making the car radically lighter weight. This used to mean just light metals, which are rather expensive. It can now also mean ultralight steels, and the strongest and lightest solution is carbon composites. That's what this handmade $400,000 uh, car from Mercedes called an SLR McLaren is made of. It happened to get hit sideways by a Golf, which was totaled. Uh, all that happened to the McLaren is the side panel popped off, so they pop it back on and they'll fix the scratch later. But if you look under the hood, you would find in the front corners uh, seven kilograms of these cones, two of them, uh, weighing therefore two-fifths of a percent as much as the car, but able to absorb its entire crash energy hitting a wall at 105 kilometers an hour. That's because these m materials can absorb six to twelve times as much crash energy per kilogram as steel and do so more smoothly. We do not we need weight for strength. If we did, our bicycle helmets would be made out of steel, not carbon fiber. 
Uh, <clears throat> and therefore, with such light but strong materials, we can make cars that are big, uh, therefore comfortable and protective, without also making them heavy, which is hostile and inefficient. And we can also make them cheaper to manufacture, so we save oil lives and money simultaneously. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, vert a, a um, show car of a complete virtual design that my team did with two European Tier 1 firms six years ago. It's a mid-sized SUV, five adults in comfort, two cubic meters of cargo. It can haul a half ton up a 44 percent grade. It weighs less than half as much as a steel car, but is safer even if it hits that steel car twice its weight. Uh, remarkable safety and uh, quite brisk performance. The uh, gasoline hybrid version using a Prius engine would do 3.6 liters per 100 kilometers, 67 miles a gallon. The hydrogen fuel cell version 2.1 or 114 miles per gallon. And the hybrid gasoline version would cost an extra two and a half thousand dollars retail, which would be a one year payback at uh, say Japanese or European fuel prices or a two year payback at US fuel prices. Uh, <clears throat> the materials to do this, by the way, uh, are getting a lot cheaper to make. There's a new process, and I brought along a little helmet made of it that shows you how plastics have changed uh, since that film, The Graduate, in the 60s. Uh, <clears throat> and with, such, with this new process, we can make automotive structures at automotive cost and speed, but with near aerospace performance, thus making it possible to make such a car in practice. The manufacturing is radically simpler because there are only 14 parts in the body, each of which can be lifted with one hand and no hoist. Uh, each is made with one low pressure die set, which is 10 or 20 times fewer parts and 40 to 80 times fewer tools than you need for a steel auto body. Uh, <clears throat> the parts then snap precisely together for gluing, so you don't need jigs, robots, and welders. You just got rid of the body shop. If you lay color in the mold, you got rid of the paint shop. Those are the two hardest and costliest parts of making the car. Uh, therefore, the capital intensity is at least two-fifths less than the leanest plant in the industry today. The plant is also two-thirds smaller, so the risk-reward ratio is about four times better. Very good disruptive technology, especially for early adopters and new market entrants. Uh, <clears throat> this is, by the way, how all the moving parts fit together after a great deal of analysis you'll find in the book. Rather than needing this much oil in 2025, the U.S. could displace this much uh, by $12 a barrel efficiency and still be in the process of displacing nearly the same again as we gradually turn over the vehicle fleet. So to meet the net demand, well, we could meet a, a good part of it with biofuels, biolubes, biomaterials, all robustly competitive against $26 oil. We could substitute some of the saved gas in simple ways there is still some domestic oil output forecast. We would still need to get five million barrels a day from somewhere else. Well, maybe we should buy more efficiency because it's so cheap, or wait and get the rest of it that is still being captured. Or we could continue to import oil from Canada and Mexico, or we could drop our illegal tariff and let in the Brazilian and other Central and South American biofuels. Uh, oh, I haven't yet accounted for two-thirds of the saved natural gas. It turns out we can save half of U.S. natural gas at less than a dollar a gigajoule. And that w the, the rest of it would directly uh, fill this balance term, or if we made it more profitably into hydrogen, it could also displace all the domestic oil because then we could use it much more efficiently than as gas. Uh, this does not count other options. For example, available very windy land in the Dakotas could produce, cost effectively by then, uh, 50 million tons a year of hydrogen, which would be enough at these levels of vehicle efficiency to run every highway vehicle in the country, uh, also cost effectively. Now, let me shift to electricity, about 40 percent of the global CO2 problem and along with industry, uh, China's biggest contribution to CO2 release. Something very interesting has happened recently, and we assembled these data uh, 
in the middle of last year and uh, later la that year uh, Eric Martineau's group at Tsinghua came up with very similar conclusions themselves. If you look at the uh, combined heat and power, that is cogeneration capacity and output in the world, and this is two-thirds gas-fired, so it saves at least a factor two on carbon compared to what it replaces. And if you then look at uh, decentralized renewables, not counting big hydro, uh, I've used here a 10 megawatt cutoff for small hydro, but if I use the Chinese convention of 30 megawatts, that would add another 14 gigawatts of small hydro, this red curve capacity in 2004. And if you add all these up, you find that already they're bigger than nuclear power worldwide in both capacity and, as of last year, in output. In 2004, they added three times as much output and six times as much capacity as nuclear power added worldwide. And the respective industries projected by 2010, the capacity added by these low or no carbon micropower options will be about 160 times as much as nuclear power will add in that year. Uh, this does not count savings of electricity, which are probably bigger, but not being well tracked. But altogether, uh, they're big enough that the savings of electricity plus low or no carbon micropower are adding already an order of magnitude more annual capacity than nuclear power. And this is before Kyoto entered into force. I think it's actually driven by these options simply being cheaper and lower in financial risk. And to test that hypothesis, we constructed on a, uh, a consistent accounting basis uh, a comparison of the delivered cost of electricity from various options. Some of them are remote, so you must pay a delivery cost, which we understated. And some are on site, so they're already delivered. Your actual costs may vary, but we've done the comparison in a way that is uh, in favor of central plants. And for those, we use the MIT study, the most careful and empirically based one, uh, <clears throat> which said that a nuclear new kilowatt hour uh, from a light water reactor costs about seven cents. And uh, that means by the time it's delivered, it's close to 10 cents. If, however, you use the latest industry uh, estimate, Electricité de France, for the new French unit, then you would add another cent per kilowatt hour because that's already 20% over the estimates that MIT used. On the other hand, if the new U.S. subsidies are extremely successful in reducing cost and perceived risk, they might get you down to here. Actually, Standard & Poor's said that those new subsidies, roughly equal to the entire capital cost, uh, would not materially uh, improve the builder's credit rating. So I think the effect of the new subsidies will be that of uh, defibrillating a corpse. It will jump, but it will not revive. Uh, now, coal plants are a bit cheaper. If you had a $100 a ton carbon tax, they'd get roughly to where nuclear was already. Combined cycle gas, similarly. But these are not the only competitors. For example, wind power. I took the median cost for the last 2.7 gigawatts commissioned in the U.S. over the past six years, uh, but actually some of the plants were at less than half that cost already. So there's already a lot of uh, good lower cost examples than I used. If you took away their production tax credit, it would go up a little, but meanwhile the cost comes down a lot more. If, by the way, I took away the nuclear subsidies that were already in place before 2004, we would be way off the top of the chart, an extra three or four cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and then there's combined heat and power done conventionally in industry or in buildings or with recovered waste heat. And cheapest of all, efficient use of electricity in industrial and commercial sites. If you're not so good at it or do a lot of residential improvements, it can cost a few cents a kilowatt hour. If you're really good at it, uh, it can have a negative cost, both new and retrofit. But the point is you have to look at all of these competitors. And in particular, you have to look at their relative cost as climate solutions. If, for example, you spend 10 cents to buy one new nuclear kilowatt hour delivered, that could displace one kilowatt hour of coal power. That's good. But if you spent the same 10 cents on these other options that cost less, you will get more solution per dollar, two to 10 times more. 
So we have to look at the opportunity cost that you cannot spend the same money on two different things at the same time. When you buy one thing, you're not buying another thing. That's opportunity cost. Therefore, if climate is a serious problem, as I think we all agree it is, then we need the most solution per dollar and the most solution per year. And we must invest judiciously, not indiscriminately. This is especially true, of course, as the costs of renewables continue to come down. These are the latest U.S. government figures. Uh, <clears throat> and also, we have some market experience about what happens when you actually have fair competition. We tried that for four years. We led all ways to save or produce electricity, compete rather fairly. And within just a few years, uh, the utilities had either bought or been offered 143 percent as much uh, power as they needed at the time. And this forced a suspension of the bidding because in one more year they would have had to close every fossil and nuclear plant in the state because of this glut. If you actually let everything compete, you tend to get too much, not too little. Also, if you look at the ultimate size of these alternatives, the American Utilities Think Tank uh, feels that 40 to 60 percent of U.S. electricity can be saved cheaper than operating a coal or nuclear plant, even if building it costs nothing. Our more detailed analysis found a bigger potential. It doesn't matter who's right. These are both very, very big numbers. So is cogeneration. Wind has been found by U.S. and Chinese analysts to be about twice as big a practical potential as the total electricity use of our respective countries. Or worldwide, it's about nine times. Uh, <clears throat> the global demand. Uh, other renewables are even bigger, especially photovoltaics. And it turns out that if you properly diversify these resources in type, in where you put them, you forecast them in modern ways, and you integrate them with existing supply and demand side resources, their variability is not important. All sources of electricity are variable or intermittent. They differ only in how much can fail uh, at once, for how long, for what reason, and how predictably. And in that respect, even, say, wind power or solar uh, is much less problematic than the big thermal plants we have already, including nuclear. Of course, if we count 200 other kinds of hidden economic benefits of making electrical resources the right size, uh, <coughs> then we get uh, even a further factor 10 increase in value, which I have not counted. I think you're counting 25 minutes, but I was told 30. Uh, I'm watching my watch. Uh, and <clears throat> you can actually, uh, with, with these distributed benefits uh, described in this economist book of the year that you get at smallestprofitable.org, uh, you can <clears throat> make even very expensive resources handmade on a lab bench uh, profitable today if you put them in the right place and use them in the right way. Now we saw this graph yesterday of the rapid progress in say refrigerator efficiency. I wanted to add a few more points to it. The standard Japanese market model was up here in 1995. The best Japanese model ten years later was down here. Uh, <coughs> the current Chinese uh, standard if you correct to US size is somewhere around here. I've had this one in my house since 1983, and the state of the art is down here. So there's always more to be done technologically, even at lower cost. Also, there is a great deal more to be done with design. I live at 2,200 meters in the Rockies, where it can go to minus 44 Celsius. And yet, in the middle of my house, I've harvested 28 banana crops. This is what it looks like in January. And I have no heating system because it's cheaper not to put one in, and I don't need one. It's cheaper to use very thick insulation and windows that insulate like 12 sheets of glass. Then the cost of the house goes down. If I also save, as I did, 99% of the water heating energy and 90% of the household electricity, that was a 10-month payback in 1983. Today, we would save two-thirds of the remaining electricity, and it would cost even less. Here's a house that is comfortable with no air conditioning, costs less to build, saves compared with a typical U.S. house about a factor 10. Here's a house in Bangkok, one-tenth the normal air conditioning energy, more comfortable, normal construction costs, nothing extra. This is just from good integrative design. 
So although we are often told in economic theory that we have diminishing returns, the more energy we save, the more and more it costs, actually, if we keep going and save even more, we can even make the cost go down. So at first, I add more insulation to my house. I do see diminishing returns. But when I add so much that I no longer need the heating system, I save its entire capital cost, and I get a 99% heating saving at lower cost than if I tried to save little or nothing. This is all explained in our book, Natural Capitalism, from Shanghai Popular Science Press, also now on the Mandarin web. Now, the same is true in big buildings. In this case, lower construction cost and a big energy saving. You can do it also in very simple ways. Here's a school in Brazil where adding an exterior light shelf and an interior light shelf to distribute light better in the room <coughs> saved three quarters of the lighting energy compared to the unshaded no light shelf classroom next door so they can afford to buy books and also students learn better in daylight classrooms big leverage for development or to pick other examples of how simple it can be as our master mr lee says to eat the feet which of course we should be doing when we use energy uh, <coughs> Here's a pumping example, a 92% saving in pumping energy in a runaround loop in a factory just by using fat short straight pipes rather than thin long crooked pipes. And if we'd done it even better, we would have saved about 98, not 92% at even lower cost. But in both cases, the cost goes down. This is not very difficult. Uh, and if you save friction or flow in a pipe, you save about 10 times as much coal at the power plant because of all the losses you avoid in getting the energy into flow in the pipe. You get huge leverage going back the other way, and you also make the equipment smaller, simpler, and cheaper. So we start off with simple things like laying out pipes in a different way so that we get rid of unnecessary bends, because bends mean friction, valves mean friction. Here's a pipe layout done in this way, a retrofit, which a pipe fitter would say is very ugly workmanship. It's not all at neat right angles like they teach you to do, but it saves three quarters of the energy and eliminates 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance cost. Or if you take the standard pipe arrangement for bringing back cool water from a cooling tower to a chiller in a big building, if we lay it out instead in this way, everything gets better less space, less weight, less energy, less labor, less maintenance, less capital cost. Everything gets better. Over 90% energy savings, cost less, works better. We can apply this thinking throughout. And I want to end with, I think, three, two or three slides. One is some examples from our industrial practice. We've redesigned in my institute over $20 billion worth of facilities in 20-odd sectors in recent years. So we find you can save half the motor system electricity with less than a year payback because if you buy the, the correct seven savings, you get 28 more as free byproducts. We've had similar savings on getting over half the energy out of chip fabs used to make clean water or ch chilled water and clean air. Texas Instruments just started up a new fab, 20% electric savings, 35% water savings, 30% cheaper. That's why it was built in Texas, not China. The next will save more and cost less. Big buildings, we tend to save 80 or 90% of the energy at lower cost. We can even have negative cost retrofits. In big hydrocarbon facilities, here are some that we've done recently, very large savings, typically 40, 50, 60%. Paybacks of a few years, or if it's new, lower capital cost. Same in mining, same in a data center, same in supermarkets, same in a chemical plant. Whatever sector we look at, there's over 100 years worth of rapid energy savings to be done in industry. And here are two cases that scope the world's conditions. Sweden, cold, cloudy, heavily industrialized, quite efficient. The State Power Board found in 89 that they could save half their electricity at four times lower cost than making more. And if you combine that with a little fuel switching and running most of the plants that emit the least carbon, then they achieved the forecast GDP growth. They shut down the nuclear half of the power supply. They reduced the carbon emissions by a third from the heat and power sector, and electric service cost goes down $1 billion a year. 
Nothing was done about this, but it's an excellent analysis. The late Amulya Reddy in India did a similar roadmap for Karnataka state. They would have had on his prescription three-fifths less need for electricity, two-thirds less cost, 200 times less fossil fuel CO2 than the official plan. Neither plan was implemented. But in both cases, uh, the efficiency more than paid any extra cost of the renewables. And as I've suggested, modern renewables may not cost extra. But in both cases, the major carbon savings were therefore better than free overall. So that's with 1980s technologies. It's without the new design techniques that let us tunnel through the cost barrier. So I end with my hope for China. China has five times as many brains as the United States because brains are evenly distributed one per person. 90% of the basic technologies used in the Industrial Revolution were invented in China. This is a country with extraordinary capabilities. So I would ask you to aim high. Don't just aim to match Japan's uh, low energy intensity because Japan itself, according to the president of Tokyo University, can profitably triple its energy efficiency. It is very good that energy efficiency is the top development priority in China. I wish it were here. But if we can build a gigawatt of coal plants a week, why can't we build a gigawatt of efficiency a week? Uh, by reversing the investment ratio, a very, very strong incentive to do so. In fact, if you don't do so, you can't afford to develop because the power sector eats the budget. As I see these inefficient new buildings going up all over China, uh, inefficient factories, inefficient cars. These are all machines for destroying prosperity by wasting energy and money. Remember that electric efficiency takes 10,000 times less working capital because of higher uh, intensity and, and lower velocity in supply. Therefore, if you use electricity very efficiently, you can turn the power sector into a net exporter of capital to fund other development needs. Huge macroeconomic leverage. The more you have competitive power markets and transparent political decisions, the more technologies driven by the old central planners, like nuclear, will fade. The war, wind, and micropower will flourish. China is already a wonderful innovator in a lot of areas, and I think cars could be next. China is hoping to leapfrog the West. Go for it. That would be good for everybody. I think China is going to turn out to be much more part of the solution than part of the problem because of the extraordinary talent and hard work that China is bringing to its development needs, and along with that, the byproduct will be profitable climate protection. Thank you. Thank you, Amory. Let me now introduce uh, Peter Schwartz. Uh, Peter Schwartz is the co-founder and head of the Global Business Network. He was formerly head of long-range planning for Royal Dutch Shell. He was the co-founder of the very successful uh, mail-order garden implements company, Smith & Hawken. It's really Schwartz & Hawken. But, <laughs> but um, he uh, is... Uh, a, an extraordinarily uh, creative thinker about uh, trends, scenarios, their implications, and how to do better. And so, uh, with no more ado, I give you Peter Schwartz. Thank you, John, and, and thank you, Amory. Uh, both John and Amory have been collaborators for a very long time, uh, as are a number of the organizers of the conference. Uh, let me say I'm really honored to be here. Uh, first of all, for two fundamental reasons. I, I think along with many of the other speakers, and probably many of you, uh, feel that climate change is undoubtedly the greatest crisis facing humankind. And I'm going to argue that it's even greater perhaps than we've estimated so far. And secondly, uh, clearly as several speakers have pointed out, the key countries to deal with this issue are the United States and China. If we get it right, the problem for the rest of the world is a very different thing. And if we get it wrong, there's almost no hope that the rest of the world can overcome our errors. So the leverage of what we do as two nations on the fate of humankind is enormous. And 
that's the, the first opening remark. Secondly, uh, I want to observe that this is my third climate speech uh, in eight days. Uh, last Monday, or last Tuesday, I spoke at a small private conference organized by Google.org, uh, which is devoting 1% of its profits. Google is devoted to uh, public works of various sorts, and they've decided on their priorities, and one of their three priorities, along with global health and poverty, is climate change. Uh, they will be devoting a significant amount of their resources to dealing with this crisis. On Thursday, I spoke in Sacramento uh, at a meeting of the leaders of the state of California, also sponsored by UC Berkeley, Stanford, and UC Davis, on integrating all of the state of California responses with respect to climate change. The reason I mention these is that there is a remarkable degree of convergence. You heard today from Shell, We've heard from the private sector, the public sector, the NGO sector, the philanthropic sector, uh, that we are converging on dealing with climate change. There's only one actor left out. There's only two people in America, of course, who still don't believe in climate change. They are George Bush and Dick Cheney. And even they, I suspect, before they leave office, will come around. Um, so there is, I think, a growing global consensus uh, at every institutional level uh, and resources, I suspect, will not be the critical issue, i.e., we are going to be applying funds, attention, time to this issue. So what we do is really much more the issue today than uh, whether we're going to respond. Now, my sources of concern about this issue is not that climate change is no longer a recognized issue. I think we do. It is the fact that we live in a time of surprises. Um, like Amory, I write books. One of my books is called Inevitable Surprises. Uh, that is, that surprises keep happening. We were hit by a tsunami. You'll find that in uh, the study we did for the National Academy of Engineering on the future challenges for engineering as the most likely major world disaster for which we are not prepared and no one is preparing. That was three years before the tsunami. Katrina, totally well anticipated. 9-11, four different commissions anticipated it. I was struck yesterday as I listened to the various speeches, and John Hartz was an excellent example of this, at how many referred to, well, they're extremely low probability events, but let's focus on the more likely events. John gave us destabilization wedges, which I think was a very useful idea. I'm a big fan of Rob Sokolow's stabilization wedges. But destabilization wedges is a new idea, and I think a very useful one. We heard again and again about extremely low probability scenarios. But the problem is that many low probability scenarios begin to add up, and eventually something does happen. And my view is that we are, in fact, facing a number of apparently low probability scenarios but that are, in fact, much more likely in terms of extreme climate conditions on the one hand and on the other, the difficulties of implementing technology. We heard, this leads me to my second source of concern. As John Holdren mentioned, um, I sat near the top of the Royal Dutch Shell Group during the 1980s. I was in charge of long-term strategy for the group. Uh, involved in investing in those times. We didn't have quite as much profit as, as Bjorn does. Today, we had only 13 billion to invest uh, annually. Uh, on new exploration, new technology, and so on. I'm also a director of a microfuel cell company uh, in near Seattle, investing in small-scale fuel cell technology. And the thing I've learned very painfully is how slowly and difficult it is to bring new technology, particularly in the energy sector, to market. I think Amory is undoubtedly right about the economic potential, the technological potential of nearly every example that he gave you. I served as a director of RMI when Amory rightly got energy efficiency, the hypercar, the, hy the uh, hybrid car, right long before industries and the world did. However, it's taken us a very long time to begin to achieve many of the potentials which Amory has argued. And I think the argument that, in fact, this is the potential is correct, but my experience sitting at the table of making decisions about energy technology and their implementation is that it moves far more slowly than we would wish. The momentum of history is great. John Holdren pointed out yesterday what percentage of the world coal capacity will be around at half century. Uh, the momentum of history is enormous, and the best technology does not always win. 
Many factors influence the choice of technology, uh, labor practices, politics, and so on, and it isn't always clear that the most efficient technologies will win. Many of the plans that Amory suggested, he had to say, well, they weren't actually implemented. And the reason was probably local politics, local interests, local conflicts, and so on, that prevented even the best solutions from going forward. So unfortunately, in my view, the real surprise-free scenario was expressed yesterday by David Hawkins, and that is lots more coal. And that's a very unhappy scenario. It is not a, ha a scenario that anybody is designing or intending for, but it is the scenario we are getting because everything else will move more slowly and will be blocked in one way or another. And so it's that combination of the magnitude of climate change and the likelihood of hot, great surprises combined with my sense of how difficult it is to actually implement and bring to market the kind of solutions that I think are suggested as technologically possible. Let me talk just very briefly about why I think the issue is more urgent than we say. Uh, this is the history of climate change in human history. Um, and this was real global warming. Hmm? Uh, you can see the scale here. Uh, this is when human civilization really began, roughly 10,000 years ago, when the climate warmed and stabilized uh, and began what we call an interglacial. And in that period of time, basically, you could settle down, and you, your, town, your village could become a town, could become a city. Urbanization developed, and civilization with it. Agriculture could develop, because you could predict and rely on the crops that were coming along. Uh, and so we got civilization. Civilization was a product of global warming, but more importantly, global stability. And that's the key point. What we've enjoyed for the last 10,000 years is a fair amount of stability, with some important excursions along the way. We had an event here 8,200 years ago where the climate cooled rather significantly for a century. The world as a whole was colder, drier, windier during that period. We had the medieval warming. That's when the Scandinavians came to North America and were growing grapes here. They called Greenland Greenland because it was green. Uh, it wasn't covered with ice in those days. Uh, and of course we had the Little Ice Age. Now, in fact, I did the first global climate assessments back in 1977 when I was at Stanford Research Institute with Mark Levine, uh, when for us the issue was global cooling because the world had cooled from 1960 to 75. And the question that ERDA then was asking, the Energy Resources and Development Agency, well, Energy Research and Development Agency, was were we going to need much more energy to deal with another little ice age? Now, we reached the conclusion you couldn't tell the sign of the direction, but you could anticipate the signals of change. And in fact, that is what happened. We saw all the signals that climate is changing. There's no doubt in my mind that the climate is changing. But if we look at the really long-term history of climate change, this is what we see. This is the last 70,000 years. This is the normal climate of the Earth. There's that global warming. There's our 10,000 years of stability. Uh, we want to keep this around as long as possible. Carrying capacity up here is probably 8, 9, 10 billion people. Down here, it's about 2. Uh, and this is a world we won't like very much. Now, as Ines Fung yesterday suggested, it is unlikely that we're going to return to this world. But imagine that the past is the future. Here's today. Right here. And that this little warming here that we're experiencing might be the trigger eventually to another world. Now, I'm not suggesting that we are in the brink of an ice age, but what I am suggesting is that instability is the norm. Uh, that is what we've experienced, and we might experience, for example, a large excursion northwards, much warmer. Imagine the world like Brazil, much more tropical, weather extremes. As the world absorbs more energy, my background is in fluid mechanics. I'm literally a rocket scientist. Uh, and as the world absorbs energy, from the sun, uh, as it increases, it, that energy is going to go somewhere. It'll go into the oceans, it'll go into the atmosphere, it'll go into more extreme storms, it may go into drying the soils, it may produce cool in the north and much warmer in the south. Uh, we don't know yet. We are in unknown territory. Uh, and as we know with all natural systems, every moment in time is in fact unique. Uh, and that is the case going forward. We don't really know what will happen. What we do know is that the likelihood of extremes is increasingly large, and the likelihood of stability may be diminishing. And so I worry extremely about the likelihood of low probability, high consequence events that are going to cause much greater dislocation than we would otherwise anticipate. Okay. 
It's been suggested that uh, we have this equation. John used a version of this equation, and so did Amory. I want to simplify the terms of the equation and basically just say climate change equals the middle class times energy technology. That is, how well are we living and with what technology? Um, and we can take most of those terms that both Amory and John had and subsume them within those relatively simplified terms. And I think we have a moral obligation to end poverty. Uh, I, I think we heard that this morning from George Akerlof, and I think that's absolutely right. Uh, people want to live better, and they're going to do it. That will happen. We're going to do it, no matter what. Climate be damned or not. But we're going to do it. That will happen. The population growth is slowing dramatically. We listened to Paul Ehrlich 30 years ago, and we've done something about it. So the real lever is in technology, and that's what we need to focus on. Now, one important consideration which we've not spent much time on is the future of oil prices, because, of course, the most important conservation organization in modern history was not the Sierra Club, and my good friend Michelle Perot is here, and Sierra Club has been very effective. It was, of course, OPEC. Uh, OPEC drove more efficiency gains than anybody else. I mean, Amory talked about the big efficiency gains in the United States. They weren't driven by policy. They were driven by OPEC. We responded to OPEC. Uh, and that, they are fortunately being helpful again. So if we look at the future of oil prices, we can see three different scenarios put forward by different people. This is the super spike put forward by Goldman Sachs, and that implies basically we're running out right now. We've hit the peak, um, and any small perturbation will push things up. But of course, it'll collapse demand when it reaches that height, and we'll see prices fall again, but then come right back up again because we really are running out. That's their view. Charlie Maxwell, a longtime observer of the industry and very good on the subject, says, yeah, we're really running out, but we're actually, OPEC will manage the supply and keep it right up here at around $70 a barrel or so. Cambridge Energy Research basically said this is in fact just simply this price increase, another price cycle, commodity cycle, low investment in the past. I mean, low prices produced low investment, high demand. Now, high prices killing demand, leading to more investment, and we will see another price cycle, prices coming back down and then drifting back up. Frankly, I believe more like the Syrah case. Um, I think we are not at the peak. This is about the sixth peak of oil that we've talked about. Uh, there are probably several more to come, probably somewhere near mid-century. So we may not have the benefit of high prices to sustain us in the near future to continue to drive efficiency. My fond hope is that we in the United States will get rational and increase taxes to make up the difference and not pay it to Riyadh and pay it to Washington instead, but we have never shown any predilection for political rationality. Uh, so now focusing on the technologies themselves and what will accelerate it. Well, one thing just to, to think about in the long term, and, and, and Amory rightly emphasized electricity and uh, transport fuels, these may begin to converge over time as we ultimately think about things like producing hydrogen, charging batteries, and so on. So I, I want to look at all the technologies together uh, because eventually they begin to interpenetrate in ways that they don't today. So this is a, a familiar list. Uh, and uh, this is the price uh, today, according to the cost today, according to The economists. But as we know, one of the critical issues going forward is that we're going to be changing those costs, both by looking at, by improving the quality of the technology, but also by changing policy relative to our priorities as well. So just moving quickly through them, we're going to do everything we can on efficiency. We'll implement everything. Uh, I'm a fan of Amory's book like everybody else. Uh, I think it's important to realize that with respect to conventional vehicles, the guys who build conventional vehicles are going to try to make those much more efficient. ICEs will become much, internal combustion engines will become much more efficient. Producers of fuels will get much more efficient, and so on. So I think there's no doubt that what we're going to see is much more efficient everything, conventional vehicles and, of course, uh, uh, all other applications. Uh, hybrids. That's the thing of the moment. We're going to see various forms of hybrids compete. Uh, diesel hybrids, ICE hy hybrids, maybe even CNG hybrids. I think plug-ins will become fairly universal, that it's foolish not today to make hybrids plug-in, and they're likely to be the early winners. But I think one of the things that we've seen, and several speakers have mentioned this, is that much of the improvement is being taken in amenity. Uh, my wife feels guilty uh, in the carpool. The other two ladies have uh, Priuses, uh, but she drives a BMW X3. Uh, but she's a gardener. She needs a lot of room. So she went out and looked at the Lexus hybrid, that would be appropriate, right? Carry lots of stuff. Unfortunately, the Lexus Hybrid doesn't get much better mileage than the BMW X3. Uh, so 
that's the, the, the part of the problem that we are facing in, even with hybrids. Electrics. Well, electric vehicles could come back if the battery performance improves significantly, but we still have a significant technological challenge in really improving the power to weight ratios of batteries. It almost certainly will happen, but it has moved far more slowly than people expected. And I will say, as a director of a fuel cell company, our company is now the leader in the technology of producing micro fuel cells, and we're three years behind schedule and running out of money. Uh, so the point is very simple. And nearly everybody else who has promised to bring fuel cells to market for the last five years is behind, whether automotive companies or portable electronic companies, whether Sony, Hitachi, Ford, GM, GE, everybody is behind. The problem has proved far more difficult than people anticipated, i.e., producing a reliable, cheap fuel cell. We will get there, but it's going to be a decade before we have them in any significant numbers, if at all. Uh, in the end, I think it's going to be uh, intense competition among a great many different sources of uh, mobile power. Uh, it'll be like the early part of the last century when we had gas, steam, and electricity competing. But in the end, my guess is that it'll be electricity that wins, electric vehicles that win, because the electric power problem may be more tractable than all the pro uh, issues of how do you put sufficient power on the vehicle. Biofuels, that's the solution of the day. Uh, but again, it's going to hit problems. Uh, it's going to be an important part of the solution. But today, biofuels are not about climate and energy. They're about agricultural subsidies. Uh, that's what's driving policy today. Uh, we have all the issues of trade politics. We will hit environmental issues with it once we start trying to do it in a large volume. Uh, and we'll hit labor issues. What fuel, what biomaterials you use makes a difference in terms of the CO2 equations. So from that point of view, it isn't a done deal that the biofuel revolution will necessarily be all positive in respect of both implementation and CO2 implications. Clean coal, lots of work going on on that, but as we know, doing it economically and environmentally benignly on a large scale, still very hard. Renewables, we're going to do everything we can, but we put an enormous amount of money into solar photovoltaics over the last 30 years, and we've made modest progress. We'll do it all, but it won't be sufficient. Uh, and even then we run into problems. Here in Alameda County, we shut down our windmills because for the winter during the maximum electricity season because we killed one bit bird per windmill per season. Um, and so we shut them down. Uh, they have their problems. In Nantucket, they don't want to build them because Bobby Kennedy Jr. doesn't like the sight of them. Um, so, uh, and Sierra Club stopped them in Pennsylvania because they don't like the sight of them. Uh, they have their problems as well. Nuclear. Amory went into a long discussion on why nuclear is a bad idea. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, I think we are going to continue to improve nuclear technology. We're going to have to invest in new kinds of nuclear fuel cycles. And it will be one of the options that we move forward with, uh, whether Amory likes it or not. Hydrogen is going to be extremely difficult to achieve on any large scale, but eventually we will certainly get there. Uh, but where we get the hydrogen makes a difference in terms of CO2. Today we have the beginnings of a hydrogen economy around the refineries of the United States. We already produce and use hydrogen for chemical industrial purposes, and that's where it is likely to develop, in the refinery envelopes, where we already have the beginnings of a hydrogen economy. So we'll have a variety of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, buses, trucks, fleet vehicles, etc., in the neighborhood of refineries. And that's an opportunity, I think, for China as well. So, there are a few things that could accelerate technological change that we don't actually think about. One, of course, is continuing extreme weather. More Katrinas uh, will accelerate concern, rightly or not. There's no guarantee that Katrina had anything to do with climate change, but everybody assumes it did. So that's not a bad thing. There'll be more of those, and people will take them as the sign. Better science. We need to be able to understand the, the science of climate change far better, and that will lead to it. And then here in the United States, we have a big problem. Amory has been a consultant to GM and Ford for a long time. They love Amory. The problem is they're not bringing the cars to market. And the reason they're not bringing the cars to market is because their costs are too high. They're trapped by their legacy costs. Can we solve GM's health care and pension costs? If so, they'll bring us clean cars. If not, they won't. That's what they're holding the country up for at the moment. Okay. Now, I, I won't spend much time on this because I'm running out of time, but I think David Hawkins' conclusion is right. And that is that while there's a conventional wisdom surprise-free scenario of a relatively balanced scenario going forward in the future, unfortunately, I think that's extremely unlikely. 
Virtually everything that we have talked about here will happen more slowly than we would like, whether it is efficiency, whether it is nuclear power, whether it is renewables, it will move more slowly than we would wish. And as a result, the fallback fuel will be coal, lots more coal, and some more oil. And with the implication of that, much more CO2. And that puts, I think, a, a, a further premium on a comment that Peter Hayes made, is the need for adaptation. Because if we're lucky, we won't go quite far down that road, but that's only going to be with good luck. And we're going to need to deal with things like Bangladesh, which will be uninhabitable uh, within a few decades if we proceed down this road. Okay, so conclusion. How do we accelerate change? Well, first of all, we recognize that there's a need to radically reduce greenhouse gases. Small increments of movement are insufficient. Kyoto doesn't go nearly far enough. That reducing the use of oil and coal is the highest target. Improving efficiency is where you begin, but we need a big portfolio of alternatives because the risk of being wrong on any one of them is very high. We do not have the luxury of saying no to any supply alternative or any efficiency improvement. There is great risk in that. And finding the alternatives to gasoline for cars is the most difficult, I think, I issue because it is the longest lead time. Therefore, we need all the varieties of solutions to maximize evolution. Diversity accelerates evolution. I think the private sector is key to bringing all of these cleaner technologies to market. Policy will guide the automotive and electric and fuel industries, as well as consumers. I think we do need tax incentives to accelerate retiring old plants, and I think John uh, made this point yesterday, and vehicles, and to spur investment in new capital facilities. We have to shut down some of our older plants before their useful life in historical terms is expired. We need large-scale global public R&D, probably an order of magnitude larger than we're spending today on the big hard problems. The nuclear fuel cycle, how do you produce nuclear fuel to minimize waste and minimize the issues of uh, proliferation. Hydrogen storage, no one has really solved the hydrogen storage problem adequately. Carbon sequestration on a large scale, how do we do that adequately? I know Amory believes he's solved the hydrogen storage problem. He's got a lightweight tank that will do it. I don't believe it. Uh, energy taxes, uh, we need to provide the right price signals for the new technology for a very long time. And then in the end, we have to rely mainly on the private sector for the currently useful, already widely available distributed technologies for efficiency. We need to do all the stuff that Amory is doing. We need to sustain the funding, the venture funding, the late stage funding for those companies to be able to bring their technologies to market. Thank you very much. I think that all the uh, presenters uh, present uh, very uh, uh, attractive technology, but uh, the, in China, uh, we are facing the difficult choice. Uh, I just give some example. Uh, for the uh, bio, uh, bio, bio gas utilization, and uh, we have a uh, um, uh, dairy farm. Uh, if you, they adopt the Chinese technology, the per uh, cubic meter uh, digester can produce the 0 0.3 a cubic meter methane per day. But if uh, they adopt uh, the uh, European technology, probably efficiency is three times than that, means the produce the one cubic uh, meter methane per day. But uh, the price is uh, 10 times than the domestic technology. So the, the, the project hoster facing very difficult choice. Uh, if uh, in terms of efficiency, they prefer to choose the uh, foreign technology, but nobody want to uh, put their money and uh, get them return within probably 10 years. So the efficiency and the cost, you, you know, the, it's a very hard to choose. So the, the, we should think in the breakthrough uh, uh, the point, choose the efficiency technology or cheaper technology. That's the, even they are mentioned a lot of the advanced technology. We are doing some research and analysis on this, but finally they are not uh, realistic uh, in China. That's my comments. Thank you.
Well, I thank you, Professor Wong, uh, for that comment and for agreeing to do this at the last minute. I should have mentioned that originally there were to have been uh, two Chinese members of this uh, panel speaking. Uh, uh, Dr. Li Junfeng, uh, who is the director of the China Renewable Energy Association, and uh, Michael Y.H. Pao, um, uh, who uh, works on U.S.-China joint ventures in wind power, but it's, it turned out neither was able to uh, participate. I know that we could uh, allow uh, Peter and Amory to go at each other on the points <laughs> in which they disagree, but I think it would not be fair to uh, deprive members of the audience of at least a brief opportunity to direct questions to the panelists, and so I'm going to do that. Uh, yes? Yeah, I'd like to ask about um, what do you think are the real barriers in getting Detroit to do something? If it's cheaper to manufacture the lightweight cars, is it the refueling cost of the car market? Is it our the stupidity? Legacy? The barriers to lightweight, light weighting, even with ultralight steels, uh, let alone with uh, composites, are much more cultural than they're technical or economic. Uh, but this is starting to change. You can hear the tectonic plates creaking all the way from Detroit because gazing into the abyss concentrates the mind wonderfully. Uh, and uh, we're also about to see leapfrogging, uh, including from India, possibly from China, that will get their attention. What's going on in Detroit is, is uh, Schumpeter's creative destruction process. And the market will either change the manager's minds or change the manager's, whichever happens first. Uh, unfortunately, it's more likely to have to change the managers because I, I think the, the issue is more subtle than that. Uh, if you're going to change the materials technology of something like the automotive industry, it's extremely complex. Engineers have to learn new technology. The manufacturers of the equipment who make the, uh, the cars and the materials have to learn new technologies and build and design that. I, I worked when I was at Stanford, in, 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 in Stanford Research Institute on uh, the market for the first composite the machine to make composite wings for airplanes, of which there was a market for two such machines. <laughs> um, and as it turns out, the process of introducing new materials into large-scale production is extremely slow because there are so many components that have to change along the way that even if there were complete agreement, even if there were regulatory agreement, which there has to be, i.e. crash tests, et cetera, et cetera, uh, even if consumers accepted it all, the back upstream process of bringing new materials into wide use in something as big and broad as the automotive industry just simply, at the best case, takes a couple of decades. Well, for, for, for what it's worth, this process is less than a year old, so give them time. There are very encouraging discussions going on, but the nice example is Boeing is now over 50 percent advanced composite, up from 9 percent in the previous model. So the 787, over 50 percent, huge progress, and it puts them well ahead of Airbus. Okay, let's take another question. Yes. Yeah, uh, this is a question for uh, probably Amory and Peter both. Uh, uh, as both of you know, the United States and China are both looking at coal to liquids, fissure probe fuels, as a strategic uh, fuel sourcing opportunity. Of course, the problem with it is that even the best case uh, gives you an industry that's incompatible with uh, cutting global warming emissions from the transportation sector. In the case of our Defense Department, uh, they're looking at coal and liquids as a way of sourcing jet fuel uh, needs. And my question is, uh, what, Amory, do you think is the most persuasive argument to make to, the deep, to our Defense Department about an alternative strategy that does not rely on coal and liquids? Well, as an advisor to them on, on that and related subjects, uh, they, their problem is not uh, inability to get oil one way or another. It's extremely inefficient use of oil and a uh, fat, vulnerable, costly fuel logistics supply chain that raises costs by roughly two orders of magnitude. So they're going to have to fix that. I, I think the main argument against coal to liquids in particular is cost. And it's hard to imagine that uh, private investors will put serious capital into it no matter who the customer is. The Pentagon's already made clear it's not going to uh, give uh, long-term high price purchase contracts to make the technology happen. It has to be produced under market conditions. 
I think that's the end of the story. I, I think the issue, uh, David, is that they're going to actually pursue a variety of sources. That, you know, they're concerned. Remember, uh, most of our uh, strategic reserves were things like Elk Hills to assure uh, the Navy would have fuels. Uh, I think they will produce ga focus on gas to liquids, coal to liquids, biofuels. Uh, one of their biggest challenges, of course, is aviation fuel. Uh, so from their point of view, they can't afford to take the risk uh, that they will be caught short one way or the other. So they're going to go for all of them, I think. And, I don't th and now, the, the economics of it, I suspect, will be gas to liquids will beat out coal to liquids for a variety of reasons, and biofuels may beat them both. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, our time is up. I've been instructed to uh, get out of here. I'm, I'm told I can have one more question by the, by the manager, uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, let's, I want to get somebody who I have not gotten before. <laughs> let's try over here. Yes, <laughs> sir. I think uh, I just want to ask a question. Um, the export control rules are ambiguous about what technologies are allowed to be exported. Uh, I would guess that this sort of intermediate performance low cost material is probably not uh, restricted, but we would have to find out. There are more serious issues uh, with uh, intellectual property practices in China. Uh, that I think could, could deter some transfer of technology, at least in the short run. Uh, <clears throat> but um, leapfrogging is already starting in India, and I think in time will come to China. Uh, the technology, again, has only been validated and revealed uh, to the trade within the past year. Uh, but certainly if there, are, if there are serious interest from Chinese companies, now that there is a proven process, uh, we should continue that conversation. Well, I thank uh, the panel, uh, Professor Wang, Peter Schwartz, Amory Lovins. It's been a pleasure, and I thank the audience. Thank you, John.